Hello, internet. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Please keep filing in. I'm Jen Stoikovich. I'm the executive director of SF City. We're excited for today's conversation. If this is your first conversation in mapping the Tech Exodus series, welcome. It's going to be a great afternoon chat, either lunchtime if you are on the West Coast or a little bit of a mid-afternoon coffee break if you are on the East Coast. We're going to be talking with Julie Samuels today on all things New York City, how it compares to what's going on in San Francisco, and what's next as we come out of the pandemic for the tech industry. I really appreciate it, by the way, if you were able to join from New York. I hear that it's the first beautiful spring day going on there. So um, thank you for, for joining with us. If you have not uh, had a chance to hop on, don't worry, everyone, this is recorded. So uh, we will reshare this afterwards. I'm gonna do a quick few housekeeping notes and then uh, we will get started with today's show. So first off, do you have a question for us? Uh, if you do have a question throughout today's conversation, you can drop it down in the Q&A tab. I never know where I'm pointing. There we go. The Q&A tab down there. I think at this point, we're a year into the pandemic. We all must be Zoom experts. So please feel free to drop your question in that box as we get through today's conversation. We will answer as many of these as we can. Um, so drop it in at any time. As I said, this is going to be recorded, so you can rewatch, get all those fun statistics, wonk out, be as nerdy as you want about the future of San Francisco and New York. And lastly, on social media. So if you have ideas or thoughts uh, or questions for us, please feel free to use the hashtag tech exodus, hashtag tech exodus, and tag SF City on Twitter. You'll see Jackie has dropped it in the chat there. All right, so with that being said, I'm going to bring up a quick deck right here, and we're going to talk a little bit about what is going on in San Francisco and New York. So first off, who is SF City? So we are the Tech Trade Association of San Francisco. We were founded in 2012 to empower the San Francisco tech community to have a voice in all things policy, government, uh, community leadership. We are tech's conduit uh, to the city of San Francisco, much like Tech NYC is in New York City and New York State. You're gonna hear a lot of numbers today uh, because we have created a dashboard where we are specifically tracking everything going on in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, how the changing tech migration is affecting folks uh, at the city as well as the rest of the country. Tons of information about various different policies uh, as well as predictions and trends that we're seeing of where tech could be moving and what the future of tech looks like. So if you want to read all of the things that I just listed, you can go to sfcity.org slash SF Tech Exodus. This is a dashboard that we keep updated. It is the one-stop shop for all things Tech Exodus San Francisco. So to set the stage for today's conversation, we're going to share a few quick facts about what's going on in the city in San Francisco, as well as in the city of New York. And we are going to bring up Julie afterwards to have a conversation about how these compare and contrast with one another. So as of right now, the office vacancy rate in San Francisco is reaching close to an all time high. So we're just shy of 18% office vacancy. To put that into perspective, if you had talked to me a year ago, we were at less than a 3% office vacancy rate. So this is an absolutely staggering amount. Uh, we have the equivalent of over 10 Salesforce towers currently on the market. There have been a number of big announcements, obviously, um, everyone from Yelp, uh, Wish, Optimizely, as well as um, some of our biggest employers have announced a remote first policy. And with that, of course, has come dropping of lease space. We don't quite know how many folks have left the city in San Francisco. Uh, we do know that there has been just shy of 90,000 USPS address changes um, outside of the city proper. So to give you a little bit of perspective, that is five times the number from 2019. 
Obviously the most notable effect of this is the huge rent drop. So our median one beds were going for 3,600 a year ago. And they are now, according to one study, as low as $1,900. So a staggering drop in rent. Interestingly enough, that same drop is not being seen in real estate and sales. So rent is having a drop, but housing prices, not as much. According to a survey we conducted of founders in the industry, we found that 63% of them plan to downsize in the Bay Area, and more than a third anticipate the majority of their workforce to remain remote. And of course, um, San Francisco, up until uh, this week, was facing a budget deficit of well over 400 million for the upcoming fiscal year, 650 million uh, over the next two years. As many folks know, things have changed with the COVID bill that just passed. And so much of that budget deficit is going to be uh, wiped out by the federal government, but it remains to be seen how San Francisco is going to move forward uh, with some of these continued spending patterns that have led to this deficit and whether or not some of our predictions around taxes will come to be true and we will be able to recover at the rate that we're currently forecasting. So what's going on in New York? So the other big exodus that you are hearing about anywhere that you go is of course New York City. I'm gonna cover a brief overview uh, and then we will bring up Julie who will really give us um, the deep dive on all things going on in the city. But at a high level, there's been a 70,000 uh, person net population loss in 2020. Uh, so that's translating to approximately 34 billion in lost income. Although this is not a huge number compared to New York's overall population, uh, most of the people leaving the city tended to be those with higher incomes. So that has been a pretty uh, big drop in lost income. There's also been a big rent drop happening in New York. I've heard lots of stories of folks that are finally moving into Manhattan for the first time in their lives because they're finding crazy uh, rent prices that they never thought that they would see. So I'm sure that'll be something we'll be talking about more. Uh, New York, of course, is facing an office vacancy rate as well. So over 15%, a 26 year high, uh, not quite as high as San Francisco, but still quite a high amount. New York will also uh, be looking at a budget deficit. So they have between a 3.8 to $6 billion budget deficit that was coming in the next fiscal year. Tax collections have fallen by 3.5%, which is pretty significant as well. Of course, we can talk about how Biden's stimulus package is addressing that deficit, um, how much of that is going to be covered, uh, what that means for the future budget, much like San Francisco. Um, there, there's a very significant impact to the federal bill that has just moved forward. It's not all news, uh, it's not all bad news coming out of New York though. So one of the things that is unique is New York tech firms saw a 75% increase in VC funding. It's almost $6 billion. And New York is now home to 17 tech unicorns the second most of any American city. I think we all know who the, the top is currently. So it'll be interesting to see how New York's recovery mirrors that of San Francisco's, um, what we can be doing as leaders in the tech industry to recover together and, and what else um, is in store. All right, with that being said, I'm back up here. I'm going to welcome the amazing Julie Samuels on stage. As we bring you up, Julie, I'm gonna launch our poll. All right, how are you? We've got you on mute. Hey, thanks for having like me. It's like the quote of 2020. You're on mute. You're on mute. I'm excited <laughs> about the poll. Can I take the poll really quickly or should we start while others are taking the poll? All right, we can start talking and then I will end the poll once we have a good amount of votes in, but people are asking or people are answering what factors matter the most to you in choosing a city to live in. We've asked this at all of our talks and it differs from city to city. We're not seeing the same thing everywhere. I believe that. Well, I believe that because, you know, each of these cities has such unique attributes. Exactly. Yeah, Nashville had a very, very different uh, response rate than Seattle did a few weeks back. All right. Um, so where do you want to start? I think the best place to start would be, let's talk about what things look like a year ago. So let's, or actually a year and a few days, let's say before the ago. pandemic was, was, uh, was announced and the whole world shut down yeah. and 
never to be reopened again. Um, what was New York sex scene looking like? And, you know, you came from San Francisco as well. So you've got a really good understanding. You understand both ecosystems. Um, I'm very interested to hear what it looked like and, and how that compared. Yeah, I think, you know, I have to say that quickly to, to set the frame here, to set the, to set the framework a little bit. A lot of the stats you had on New York, uh, are not tech specific stats. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really important point because New York's economy is so incredibly diverse and we have so many industries headquartered here, um, which is an important part of this conversation. So before, you know, in February of 2020, um, tech was booming here, you know, just growing gangbusters. And I think that that trend actually largely continues to be the case. Um, because what we're really seeing is it's not just the creation of new tech firms here, but it is the uh, process of all of these other industries becoming more technical, for lack of a better term. You know, you're yeah. seeing so many more companies that are at the intersection of finance and tech, uh, real estate and tech, media and tech, I mean, you name it, fashion and tech, whatever, all of those yeah. industries are already headquartered here. So the growth is new companies, but it's also, um, you know, uh, very old companies hiring more technical talent, bringing in tech teams. And that combination is, uh, is a really healthy combination, I think, for the city's economy. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of similar to the earlier days before the post 2008 boom of, you know, the modern tech boom we're in in San Francisco, right? We had you know, Levi's, Levi's.com, you know, Macy's, Macy's.com. I'm sure, you know, you probably remember seeing some of those retailers switching to e-commerce and they started to really kind of come into the, the tech space as well. Yeah, and we're seeing more and more of that. And, and the other thing we're seeing is more, again, new companies in those kind of verticals. And what happens is then, you know, we get a technical, technical co-founder or whatever, who brings in a substantive expert who's worked yep in that industry, but maybe doesn't know that much about tech. And all of a sudden, like now you're on to something. And that's a very New York story, again, because so many industries are headquartered here. In the early kind of, in the early big tech expansion here in New York, it was uh, like sales offices. All the big yeah. on the West Coast were opening their sales offices. Yeah, they're, sales they're and marketing. Marketing teams here. Yeah, um, But they were keeping their tech, their tech teams, their engineers mostly in the Bay. In the past five to 10 years, that has in the past five years, I'd say, that has fundamentally shifted. And now we have very robust tech teams here as well. Uh, we increasingly are seeing, you know, whole technical offices, even for company, even for companies who have a West Coast headquarter uh, spinning up here. And I think that's been an interesting dynamic as well. So that was all what was happening, you know, it, again, February of last year. It really, this is uh, the kind of, the way we thought about it for a long time, there were two things that were happening here. If you started a tech company here, or if you were an investor, for instance, here in New York, you inevitably get asked, why aren't you doing this in the Valley? And people would have answers, you know, for what they would be doing it here because they lived here or their family was here, they loved it here or whatever, yeah. but you always got asked that. Some point, you know, five to 10 years ago, you stopped hearing that question. That, that just kind of fell away. And the other thing we really saw shift here was that uh, we, we heard anecdotally a lot, of course, from engineers who would finish school and be deciding where to go, deciding where to take a job. And uh, they would have, let's say, an offer in New York and an offer in somewhere in the Valley. And they'd want to go to New York for whatever personal reason they wanted to go to New York, but they were worried that they wouldn't be able to find a second job in New York. If yeah. the first job didn't work out, it would be really tough to make a jump. And so they would choose the West Coast for that reason. Again, in the past, this one, I'd say past five years, that, that went away. You can you know, ha have an entire technical career at many different companies in New York now. Um, and so I think this is actually, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because my sense is that some of this plays into the tech exodus in San Francisco too. I think you know, a lot of people went to San Francisco or the, the Valley more broadly um, only to work in tech, not because they were dying to move to the Valley. Yeah. In New York, we didn't have that dynamic. Like if you came to work in tech in New York, you were choosing affirmatively to be in New York and not go to the Valley. Like you were saying, I want to be like, I'm making the conscious choice yeah. to be in New York. So people, I think by and large, um, I don't want to say they're more committed. That's not, I mean, the Valley is an amazing place. Like I don't mean to 
but we didn't have that dynamic. There wasn't much inertia bringing people here. So they didn't kind of leave when, when the opportunity arose. So I think there's, so there's a few things that, that I'll touch on. So first off, I think when you speak to the Valley, yeah. There's definitely, you choose the Valley because you're choosing your career. You're choosing a launch pad that, you know, if you can say that you've been in the Valley, you can go anywhere with that on your resume. I think that's, that has, that's still true to this day. But I do think San Francisco is a little different. There is something different about the quality of life and what you are committing to when you move to San Francisco. I do think that it, it has that same level of attraction that New York City has, right? It's been attracting people for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, but I do, but to the Valley overall point, definitely nobody woke up one day and probably said, you know, I dream of working in Menlo Park one day. Like, I'm so excited to go to Palo Alto. There's a San Francisco dream. There's a California dream, um, but not necessarily a Valley dream. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I mean, listen, I lived in San Francisco for a long time and loved it. And, um, you know, have had an amazing experience there. I think that's that's probably right. But then I think that the, you know, one of the things we've seen, and we have some data on this, and then kind of looking at these poll results too to see how, how they mirror well, the high concentration yeah. of professionals yeah that's why i say because you know one of the things that um we're really finding is that increasingly issues that we used to think of as secondary uh issues around like good schools and safety yeah. and i hope we'll talk about transit too because i think that's a huge differentiator between our two cities um those kinds of issues were things that at tech nyc we thought about again, secondary issues, you know, yep. the first thing, the primary issues were how do you get, how do we ensure that there's enough talent here to hire? What are the policies that directly relate to tech companies? But what we've seen over the past, surely since COVID, but I think this trend was already starting pre-COVID, is that those issues that used to be secondary are now primary. And it's about making New York City a place where people want to live and want to raise families and want to be. And if, if those things are all true, then the companies will come and stay. And then now, you, now you've got a cycle, you know, now you're feeding yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's absolutely true. And that's something that we've seen shift to with SF city, you know, originally innovation, regulations, taxes, of course, that's the bread and butter of, of what a trade association does, but increasingly these last few months for sure. But even these last few years, we started to look at that quality of life. And that has become such a huge part of how you attract talent, what our employers are looking for. You know, it's no secret that San Francisco is suffering from a, you know, quite a, quite an issue with, you know, those are experiencing homelessness. There's, there's no secret that, that San Francisco is seeing a huge uptick in public safety issues right now. Um, so a lot of those quality of life issues are the number one thing that, that folks are talking to us about right now. Mm -hmm. And I think as we think about reopening the city, we have to think about what attracts people to a city when they have the option to work remotely forever. You know, yeah. a lot of firms are saying you can permanently re work remotely, go live in the mountains, or you can work kind of sometimes in the city, you know, that whole remote first 20% of the time in the city type um, situation, which I think will be the majority of folks. How do you get them to want to come back to the city when there are so many of those yeah. quality of life issues that are seemingly worsening as well? So I feel, I mean, first of all, I feel bullish on cities, period. I just have to yeah. say you know, I believe in agglomeration. Like I, I believe in all the benefits that come from that. I believe that people in our industry in particular, but all kinds of people will always want to be in dynamic, big, exciting cities where there's yeah. access to cultural institutions and all different kinds of people. And, you know, cool people, all, cool yeah. ideas. There are people yeah. who are city people and, yeah. and by the way, there are people who are not. And like, so there will always be some kind of core group there. And I feel really, I feel good about that in the long term. The other thing I feel really good about um, and this is a very specific to New York uh, dynamic, but when you talk about the hybrid, the 20% time, however we end up figuring out what that looks like, people come into the office, let's say two, three days a week, they work from home to or whatever that might be. The thing that's really amazing about New York is not just that our subway system is super functional in New York City, but we have an amazing regional transportation network. So you can conceivably live somewhere in, Connecticut, in New Jersey, in New York State, you can live in the suburbs, you can live in the Hudson Valley, and you can commute on light rail, you can commute on Metro North, on Amtrak, two or three days a week. That's a problem for New York City's tax base. Probably, I don't, it's not like this is not a silver bullet, but I think yeah. that means that the jobs stay in the city. They yeah, stay yeah, yeah. The city because all of a sudden, what is a 90 minute commute that seemed 
horrible five days a week, a 90 minute commute on a nice train where you like, you know, the, the, if you're going up to the Hudson Valley to Albany, you like literally the train rides along the Hudson River. It's beautiful, actually. You know, all of a sudden you do that 90 minute commute twice a week is not, not so bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that means I feel really bullish that New York City will keep those jobs. And you'll, again, not great for the city's tax base. And then there's other things I'm really worried about with regard to some of those changes in the city's kind of economic makeup that we can talk about. Yeah. San Francisco's had a lot of this too. Um, but San Francisco is actually a pretty small city. Geographically speaking, it's tiny. New York is obviously not tiny, um, is huge. And one of the real issues that people are worried about right now is that we've got some serious business districts. We have a central business district, we have the financial district. And right now, those places are pretty um, bottomed out. Not bottomed out. Mm -hmm. that's not yeah, They're deserted. Um, and there yeah. are a lot of businesses, a lot of small local businesses who, you know, Times Square is another great example. Um, th there's whole neighborhoods in New York that um, rely on people being there either nine to five, five days a week or like Times Square 24 um, seven and figuring out what it looks like, like what with all that office space, all that like class A office space in Midtown. If people aren't going back to work all the time, like what does that mean for Midtown? Um, yeah, that's that's something that that we're dealing with too. And uh, before I, before I respond to Julie, I just want to recommend or remind everyone the Q and A. If you have questions throughout the chat, I'm sure you guys have ideas, thoughts, remarks. You want to push back on something we're saying? You know, feel free to drop it down the Q and A, and we'll get to them shortly. That's one of the things that we're dealing with too in San Francisco is our downtown is a ghost town. You know, we met with the chief economist yesterday and, you know, I think he said 40% of small businesses have closed. We've heard that 80% of restaurants in the, the downtown area have shuttered because they rely on those class A office buildings, as you mentioned. And there is just, there's so many more ramifications when it comes to those office buildings than I think people yeah. people thought you know so many of those small businesses and restaurants were doing catering orders for these giant yeah. offices every day and you have to think even if we reopen the offices you know i don't think i think we all know we're going to reopen the offices but if we reduce that footprint in the office 80 percent a day mm -hmm. those businesses. what is that, exactly what is that going to mean and so in san francisco the businesses that are doing well still the restaurants that are doing well still are the ones that are in the neighborhoods you know the ones that have their own corridors where they already have a community Community that's supporting them, they're still doing well. But in downtown, how do we revitalize that downtown? You know, yeah, one of the, again, again, we've done it before. We've done it before, right? One of the uh, the or one of the opportunities I think in that challenge that I'm really excited about, but recognize it's very complicated, is what it looks like if you start creating um, little locuses of economic activity in different parts yeah. of the city where it wasn't before. Um, you know, what does that mean for local? for a neighborhood that didn't have any business before, all of a sudden you've got people working there, maybe you've got new restaurants, new coffee shops, new dry cleaners, whatever. But also from, you know, I, I know you guys do a lot of work on workforce development issues. We do as well, how to ensure that more New Yorkers get access to an exposure to jobs in tech. Well, all of a sudden, if you've got a bunch of people who work in tech, working closer to their home in, I don't know, Queens, mm -hmm. um, like all of a sudden those jobs are closer to kids in New York who maybe will get exposed to them, who maybe be able to get internships there, uh, find mentors there. I mean, if you think you have to get this right, it's complicated. It's complicated yeah. stuff. You have to work with community partners, etc. But if you get that right, there's a lot of amazing opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the number one thing that we're actually hearing from founders when when it talks when they talk about reducing their footprint to just being in one location is that diversity of hiring. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. From your standpoint, do you have that same issue with the diversity of hiring, with the homogenous kind of population that, that tech has started to become in San Francisco in particular? Are you seeing that in New York as yeah. well? Yeah, I think that we have a diversity problem. Yeah. Yeah, we have that here too. Um, I mean, we're doing a lot to, you know, we talked about how important it is to attract people to want to live here. It's just as if not more important to ensure that New Yorkers are getting the kind of education and skills training to get these jobs as well. And we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of progress on that front. For instance, we um, in New York have a 10 year public private partnership called CS for all that's you know, yep. more than halfway through putting computer science education in all of the city public schools. We have 
CUNY, which is this like amazing public institution here that makes uh, secondary education very accessible, very high quality secondary education accessible to New Yorkers. And so we're starting that, we're thinking a lot about that as part of yeah. this conversation. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of work to do on that front. You know, there's one thing I, I have to, um, I haven't gotten a chance to say, and I feel like it's an important piece of the trends in New York with regard to where tech is right now. Um, and it's that the only companies who have publicly doubled down on New York City, like signed big new commercial leases, committed to hiring new employees here in New York City since COVID, you know, since March 2020, are tech companies. Facebook's mm -hmm. opened a huge new office. Amazon or has signed a huge new lease. They're doing the build out now. And offices aren't yep. open. Amazon, TikTok, um, Google has made a huge commitment to the west side of Manhattan. They made it just before COVID started, but they, you know, they're they're committed. Sticking to it. Commitment. And so actually, the only companies who've doubled down on New York are tech companies. And in fact, the companies that are leaving in that slide where you talked about our vacancy rates are like finance. 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 Yeah, you know, they're, they're all not, in Miami. They're not tech <laughs> yeah, I think it's really, it's a really important dynamic about what's going on here um, as we talk about tech. And I just wanted to make sure, I should have gotten that in at the very top because it's, yeah. it's key. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is interesting. I'm curious, uh, you mentioned that you guys had historically been satellite offices, so to speak, for West Coast operations. And one of the growing pains I think that we're going to face in San Francisco and the Bay Area is that so many founders and established companies, so both those that are creating companies and those that already have companies, are moving away from their HQ model. Yeah. So historically speaking, we would have the HQ in San Francisco or in the you know somewhere down the peninsula, wherever it might be, and then you guys would be kind of a there's the cool New York office. There's the cool Austin like office, but they're not anymore. exactly. And so I that's time to a to founder work. today who's based in down the peninsula, and they're they have a, an office here that's their quickest growing office. That in the next two to five years will be their biggest office, and their yep. entire um, executive team will end up sitting here, except for maybe the CEO and the CFO. Yeah, and like then yeah, and that's they have headquarters. Right then, their executive team is just kind of split. Yeah, I mean, that's increasingly what we're going to be seeing, you know, as we have conversations with Nashville and, you know, we're going to be talking to Miami and, and Austin, all these places, they used to be second fiddle, but now there really isn't going to be, and for most tech founders, the initialized capital report showed that three quarters of them don't ever expect to have an HQ model. So these future companies are never going to take those giant buildings, you know, the giant buildings that you have empty, the giant buildings that we have empty future founders don't see that as the way that they grow their companies. Yeah, that's, it's really interesting to think about what that looks like. I mean, I think as a practical matter, my sense is that a lot of companies who are like, we're going to be remote forever, or we're never going to have an HQ. Like my, my sense is that people will want to be together again. Yeah, yeah. And, and there will be HQs because at the end of the day, management teams want to be together. People want to have meetings. And right now, I think it'll take some time for that all to shake to shake out. Yeah. Also, in different places, it looks different. Like you can tell from my background, I live in an apartment in New York City. Like I don't have this is obviously not a home office. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I I want to go back to an looks office. Looks great. Yeah, it, it looks great. It's great, yeah. but it's not. Um, yeah. You know, and as opposed to if you're in I don't know Boulder or Miami, like maybe you do have a, a really sweet setup with like a great home yeah. office and. Like that's not happening in New York City. That's probably not happening in San Francisco, but definitely not in New York City. So like, I am, I can guarantee you, I'm going back to the office, you know, <laughs> like, did and, you, and, and, yeah. Did Go you on. hear about the sheds? Did you hear that there was like a huge, there's like all yes. these companies that are startups that are just putting like office sheds. In every yeah, <laughs> I think it's great. I mean, I think that's all, I think a lot of this is, is great. I mean, the other thing that is really interesting to me, this was true when I lived in SF, um, is that tech has always had more of a culture of work from home. Yeah. Um, well, they kind of invented and, it. For, yeah. You know, and and we, we just much more seamlessly fell into that. Yeah. But again, in New York, if you live in New York City, there's no way working from home is like pleasant. Yeah. It's yeah. That's, that's totally fair. It's like Tokyo. I would, you know, some of the the executives I've spoken to said, you know, our Asian offices, they reopened in the summer. They said, there's no way I live with, you know, six people in 600 square feet right you're like forget yeah. this right yeah no I mean, absolutely but I do I do hope there's more flexibility 
Yeah. Um, and I do hope people feel comfortable working from, you know, wherever. And I think, I think a lot of that will retain a lot of that, but not all that, at least in New York, New York is such a competitive culture that I know I really have this sense that once people start going back to the office, yeah. they get ratcheted up and, and they're all climbers. Yeah. All I mean, I hope it's not like that. And I hope that people feel comfortable working from wherever they want, but yeah, yeah. just knowing the culture in New York, I feel like, yeah, that's fair. It's a, I mean, that's what New York's known for. That's, yeah. that's why you go to New York, right? Um, so just a reminder to everyone, you can drop your questions in the tab. We also got a whole bunch through Eventbrite. We will get to them soon. All right, Julie, tell me about taxes. How's your tax base shifting? Well, our tax, uh, the city's, I mean, the city's tax base is shifting. A lot of it's gone to Florida. However, there was a huge story yesterday, not a huge story. There's a pretty funny story yesterday in Bloomberg uh, News about how all the very wealthy hedge fund types who went to Miami are now like, oh God, now I have to live in Florida. We're coming back to New York. So <laughs> I thought, that's going to be a thing. No, that's going to, you know, these, totally. these people move to these blue dots in these wildly red states, right? You know, Austin, Miami, Nashville, those are weird political dynamics. Yeah. And they're like, we're coming back now. So yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, it's been tough for the tax base that a lot of high net worth individuals have left. New York has high taxes already. Um, but that said, I, ask me again in like 18 months. I, I, I feel cautiously optimistic, but there are a couple other interesting dynamics going on here. Number one, as you uh, said in, in your intro, the bailout that Biden just mm -hmm. signed literally like an hour or two ago um, probably means we won't see as many new taxes as we might have otherwise. Oh. Well, it didn't matter for ours. Yeah. We got three that went through regardless of whether there was a bailout. Um, I think we probably won't because ours really come, you know, our state is much more powerful than our city, just the way our state constitution works. The stuff would all come yeah. from Albany. Albany is more moderate generally yeah. speaking, because the makeup of the state legislature, I can spare you guys the details, though there's probably a lot of people here who find this stuff interesting. Um, so I think we will still see some new taxes, but we won't see a lot because of the bailout. Um, we also have a little scandal going on with our governor, which is taking a Just lot a of the one. oxygen out of the room in Albany, and I think is going to make it hard to get get things done, um, get substantive work done. Our budget is due uh, at the end of the month, first week yeah. in April. And I mean, God only knows what's gonna happen now. Um, so that's another kind of piece of the dynamic. And then the last really big thing at play is we have a huge mayoral election this year in June yes. of 2021. I mean, in November, but uh, our, you know, in, not unlike San Francisco, the entire election is decided in the Democratic primary, um, which is in June, which is coming up quickly. Uh, however that plays out will change a lot, just a lot of the political dynamics, I, or could change a lot of the political dynamics. Um, and it's our first year of ranked choice voting, which you guys have had for a long Yay! time. It's our first ranked choice voting election. You'll have a nail biter then, because those oh, things are be crazy. <laughs> it already is crazy. It already is crazy. Yeah. So anyway. Well, we, we've got recalls happening left, right. And so, you know, they're trying to qualify a recall for our governor. They're, the one for the district attorney qualified the other day they just announced in San Francisco. I mean, I'm not sure how much you're paying attention, but the public safety situation has become like the the big topic uh, for a lot of folks. And in addition to the school board and getting the schools reopened, I'm sure everybody who's anyone in the country saw all of the drama about our school board. Our superintendent <laughs> stepped down. Our second superintendent in five years stepped down as well this week. So between schools, recalling the district attorney, we have our hands full too politically. Yeah, the school thing happening in San Francisco seems really intense. It is, yeah. And I, I mean, there's, it was already such a... the. San Francisco public schools have been suffering for a very long time. And the fact of the matter is like, we have the highest privatization rate of anywhere in the country, right? A third of all students go to private school in San Francisco. And the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on our public school kids, because the private schools reopened months ago. So yeah. the private schools have been open and these kids, they're already in a private institution that's better funded. Are, they've been getting in-person learning for, for a, all this time. And our poor public school kids have just been left at home in these like Zoom scenarios. And, you know, much of them don't even have like proper internet access. We had to open community hubs all over the city. Um, to your point earlier about those quality of life indicators, I think that 
what are the schools like? You know, what is the public safety like? What's the transportation like? Those are the things that our employees are asking now for their employees. It's not just about, um, you know, it's not just about the pay. It's not just about being in the capital of innovation. It's like, where can I start a family? Because millennials are, as of this year, millennials are 41. The oldest millennial is 41 years old. The oldest Gen Z, 24. Right. And we, I mean, we really, th this is why I feel bullish on New York though. A lot of, the, I mean, listen, there is a huge economic recession right now, whatever we are calling it. It's not great. Yeah. There is obviously a global pandemic. Like New York is not, cities are hit hard by these moments, but New York has all of the pieces in place. We, you know, we have, our, no one's on the subway right now. It's, that's been a huge problem. Yeah. It's something actually that the bailout bill was a really important piece of that is that our subway will get a lot of much needed funding, but our yeah. functioning public transit, you know, the pieces are all there. Our, we have a lot of work to do with our public schools, but the younger yeah. kids especially have been in school at least three days, two, three days a week for much of the year in New York City public schools. Um, it's not enough, but it's, it's frankly, better than, way better than, than most of the country, and, you know, most yeah. of the in the country. Yeah. Um, and so, I, and obviously all the cultural institutions, the museums, um, you know, the museums are open, the zoos are open, Broadway is, is real, uh, it's a real struggle for theater and Broadway. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah, and that part's been really tough for the city, but, you know, they, uh, there's a great place called the Park Avenue Armory and they just, they do some really great shows there and they just opened up and I, this is just anecdotal and they just, I think announced their first two shows and they sold out in a few hours. So people are like hungry for it. You know, they're hungry yeah. and the vax, as more and more people are getting vaccinated and as more and more stuff is opening up and as the weather is getting nice, which as you said, it's a gorgeous day here in New York. Like it, I really feel like all those all those quality of life indicators, like that stuff is going to just be moving here. Like it's going to be jamming yeah. here in New York. And I feel, yeah, I feel pretty confident. I feel bullish on, I feel very bullish on New York. And the very kind of first thing I, I was talking about at the outset, trend wise about um, tech firms kind of growing into existing industries, growing with existing industries like that yeah. trend. Is, is only going to continue. And, and I think one of the things that we've seen from COVID is that it's COVID accelerated the adoption of a lot of technology that was already underway. You know, the adoption was already underway, but COVID's accelerated mainstream adoption of a lot of things. Telehealth obviously comes to mind. Video conferencing obviously comes to mind, but I, I think even beyond Black's that- Black's acquisition. Yeah, so I think we'll see- big. I think we'll see uh, that, that, you know, as, as more and more people in the country and in the world become more comfortable using technical tools, that trend of existing industry and tech, like just the lines being blurred, that, that trend will only increase. And that really stands to benefit New York City. Yeah, I think that your, your point to the, the fact that they're, they're, you know, we call tech a thing. We just say tech is a thing. Tech workers are a thing. But it's at this point in 2021, they really aren't. They're not their own category. You know, there is tech people that work at, at you know everything from your banks to your educational institutions to the city government. And so I think that monolithic concept of tech is really just going to the wayside and, and it will have to. As we move to this new remote first environment, I think, you know, let's be honest, I think remote first is the way that a lot of folks are gonna go they have to blend together. And if, if um, companies want to be able to compete, they have to be able to compete on that level too. Yeah. I think that's right. So. And, you know, the, the financial, the banks here compete with the tech companies for when they're hiring engineers at all. Right. I mean, exactly what you're saying. Like every company is a tech company. Yeah. That's the thing. You know, that's the, you know, when we look at um, how many tech workers are in your city, it's really hard for us to be able to get a proper estimate. What, where are you guys, I, I can tell you like our guess, what it, where are you guys I mean, at? So from? our data is not, we don't have, first of all, it's not that new. It's a few years old at this point, but we think it's around through the low, I would lowball it. It's around 380,000. So I think it must okay. be much more, but then it's like, oh, are you counting tech workers who work at tech firms or are you counting exactly. technical people who work all over yeah. the city? But either way you look at it, it's probably, at this point, I would guess, you know, pushing half a million. But again, how you okay. define it is complicated. What do you guys think? 
Oh, I mean, we have that. We use like the NASEC, you know, we try to use yeah. the codes and um, the codes are they're more, not really helpful though. No, <laughs> they, they, um, need to be, they need some new definitions in the codes. Yeah, you think the federal government hasn't adapted our tax codes efficiently? Uh, I think on the high end, people say somewhere around 100, you know, maybe it's probably somewhere closer to between 80 and 90, I think. But again, everybody, they do the estimate differently. Um, but that impact on our city, when our city is less than 900,000, that is 10% of our, of our city we're talking about. So the context is really important when we talk about that. Nonetheless, I, it is important to note that tech is still only our third largest oh, really? uh, industry. What are the mm -hmm. first two? Healthcare and tourism. So okay. for San Francisco, yeah, so for San Francisco, we were always, you know, as you know, we used to be a tourist town. And one of the big pain points that we face is we have a hotel tax. It's a significant revenue driver for the city. And so mm -hmm. tourism went to zero. Tech closed down, you know, so just like that hit yeah. of the sales tax dropping at the same time as the hotel tax dropping. That was really significant. So um, they have the same problem you know, with tourism, obviously. Yeah, but, exactly. But our economy exactly. is much more diversified here. Yeah. So even yeah. though it's been, you know, terrible, but um, yeah, we have more more revenue streams coming in. You want to do a few questions? I'll read off a few. Yeah. Cool. All right, we'll go to Brad first. Well, this is bad news for Midtown. So we're talking about New York here. Could this spark a renaissance for Albany, Hartford, Newark? Yeah, I mean, so listen, you've already really seen that dynamic, particularly in the Hudson Valley, which is, is about 90 minutes north of this, well, depending on how far up in the valley you go, between an hour and two hours north of the valley, uh, the city. And that, you know, starts pushing into Albany as well, geographically speaking. So we're seeing that, I again, in places where I think where there um, are good train lines, but that dynamic was, it, like with many things in COVID, that was a dynamic that was already starting. There are- yeah. A small handful. The three towns that are uh, probably the most popular up there that people talk about a lot are um, uh, Hudson, Beacon, Kingston. People I know in tech were already kind of moving up to these places, um, which are start a family. Yeah, they're not. They're not the suburbs though at all. They're definitely yeah. a little bit more rural. Oh wow! Um, yeah, this, they're not. The Hudson Valley is not the suburbs. It's it's beyond the suburbs. Um, it's probably about a ninety minute train ride in. Um, so we started to see that, you know, to, you know, in Connecticut, you're seeing a lot of that too, especially stuff on the waterfront. I mean, we have so much coastline as you, you all do in, in California, but yeah. we got a lot of coastline here. Um, so you are seeing some, uh, Renaissance in some of these places. Um, but I think people will come back in. I mean, you know, I really think, I think they will. A lot of people in New York already do things like rent in the city and buy yeah. a house upstate first or, you know, and so I think you'll see more and more of that. Um, but the schools in those places are, you know, people move to New York, so we have great schools. We have great, great, great schools. Uh, we have public schools, we have charter schools, we have a huge private school network. Um, and so as tech yeah. workers get older, millennials are, you know, like you said, into their forties, which I kind of can't believe. Um, Scary. Yeah, they'll, uh, I think New York will always attract. Uh, yeah. What, one of the interesting phenomenons that, that we've seen is, uh, first off, when the, maybe April, May, when it started to really, the other shoe dropped and everyone said, uh-oh, like the pandemic's for real. Tahoe ran out of real estate. Like yeah. South Lake Tahoe just like literally ran out of real estate and Sacramento started booming. And, you know, what what's really kind of come out of this whole conversation of the exodus is, California as a whole, not necessarily as big an exodus as everyone, you know, as Texas or or Florida would try to make you think. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is generally speaking, we did go down a little bit population wise, but generally California is holding fairly steady. And the Bay Area has a lot of folks in it, but sim they're moving specifically from the city to other parts of the Bay Area, you know, yeah. similar to what you're saying. Can I ask you a question? Did the fires um, have all the wildfire? Have okay. they, has that played into it, do you think? So that's actually the next point that I was going to say. So, I mean, we've had the worst ever wildfire season was this year, like four out of five of the worst ones were this year. The worst ever wildfire season last year was last year, right? The four out of five, right? So the, it is exponentially growing. And that's one of the concerns. We actually talked to uh, the chief economist actually about this yesterday as we, re we turned the economy back on in the summer. 
one of the horrible consequences of this wildfire season, in addition to the fact that it's a horrible wildfire, is these new blackouts that we're facing. Because mm -hmm. they, they have to start in, for those that aren't familiar in California, a large part of the, the wildfires we're facing, in addition to you know climate change and drought, is our electrical system needs to be upgraded. And so many of the fires that have happened have been actually you know, a result of negligent um, electrical upgrades and things like that from PG&E. And so they just like turn off entire sections now yeah. when the when the winds pick up and it's affected Oakland primarily. Um, certainly there was that big orange sky day that everybody saw in San Francisco. But what happens when they have to start doing those rolling blackouts in San Francisco? And some of these are like 72 hour blackouts, too. So I, I think that I think we're going to see that become a huge part of the conversation. I actually, we're talking to the mayor of Miami next week. I actually think that one of the reasons Miami has bowed so well in this last year is because they just like got by on the skin of their teeth, not having a bad hurricane season. Not but a few years ago, though. I mean, I'm kind of, we, we kind of, I, I don't want to say joke because it's not funny, but like in New York, it's like, there's all these horrible fires, horrible, like Miami's got a huge climate change problem. Oh, there, it's like going underwater. Yeah, it's, it's like, like going underwater. underwater. Um, yeah. You know, Austin, I mean, what a terrible thing happened in Austin this year. And we're like, New York's looking better and better. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I know. we get hurricanes, but it's not, again, we don't joke because none of those things but are no, funny, no, the, but you know what I mean, yeah. I, I mean, the Canadians I talk to all the time say Toronto is looking better and better by the day. London's feeling pretty good. and But well, that is a very, president. yeah, well. That with the AstraZeneca debate, I think people are, are on two different sides now there. But I do think that the conversation around climate change in California, that was the big thing everyone was talking about and was worried about before the pandemic hit. We were talking about how are we going to you know, deal with the electrical system. There was this whole movement uh, that you might remember happening where cities were going to start buying their own yeah. Um, grids and and so we had this whole situation where San Francisco said you know I'll buy one and San Jose said I'll buy one and then you just like have all the Central Valley and all of these other um, more rural poor communities that don't have the money to buy one so where was the solution for there um, that would have been the number one topic last year if the pandemic hadn't hit it still remains a critical crucial issue in California so interesting yeah it's uh all right let's go to a couple other questions we got some good ones through on the Eventbrite um, where lies the regional advantage in SF versus New York in terms of new technology trends? So any interesting trends you're seeing industry-wise? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of danced around this uh, throughout, but again, we're really seeing, I think the most growth in um, you know, tech that's being built in existing New York industries. Um, and you know, I, I think that, that FinTech, which is a very developed, uh, subsector, mm -hmm. you know, really its own, its own kind of sector um, is, is one end of that spectrum. And I think you've got a lot coming along. Stuff's really happening in media, a lot happening in real estate prop tech right now. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting in New York, and one place that for a long time, New York did kind of lag behind the West Coast was kind of in the more B2B enterprise space, the, mm -hmm. like more the, the techier of the tech companies, if you will. And now that's really starting to flip. We've had a couple big IPOs in the past few years, Datadog, MongoDB, you know, these more kind of tech, again, enterprise B2B type products. So yeah. that is a trend that we're seeing here. And we are going to have, or have already had a couple other really big IPOs this year here, um, Oscar just IPO, Squarespace, some, some kind of homegrown tech companies too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I mean, we definitely are getting good amounts of VC funding is still coming into San Francisco um, companies. Like there's no shortage of VC funding coming in. I think it's just going to be a matter of where are these companies going to grow? Are they going to see these cities as remaining like as their remaining homes and, and their hubs, or do they see themselves mm -hmm. growing in a more decentralized way? I do think the hub and spoke model could be a really big benefit for not just New York and San Francisco, obviously the other smaller hubs. There's a lot of pros to that. There's a lot of pros to creating yeah. a diversified footprint outside of just these main cities. One of the big issues we have is, you know, the homogeneity of, of the tech population in San Francisco. Even, you know, some of the founders say things like political homogeneity. Like there's just, um, there's yeah. a lack of, you know, there's a lack of perspective that is not captured when you're missing so much of the country. 
And listen, it's good for the country. I mean, we need economic development across the country. You know, it needs to happen in all the regions. And so obviously, I mean, given where I live, where I'm raising my family, literally what my job is, like I am here to cheerlead for New York until I'm blue in the face. And I believe that fundamentally, but I also feel very strongly that, you know, listen, tech jobs are the jobs of the future. These are the careers of the future. This is what our economy is going to look like internationally going forward. Like that's, you can say whatever you want about that. Like, it doesn't matter. That is the truth. Like, I I don't need to show you data to explain that dynamic to you. I mean, that's just, that's the world we live in. And so increasingly, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us as a nation and as a society and, you know, frankly a world though, I don't need to bite off more than I can chew to ensure that that opportunity is spread. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, what was it three weeks ago, Atlanta just came out with their with their unicorn Calendly. There's, Mm -hmm. there's some really interesting thriving cities. And I think that there's a world where, you know, both San Francisco continues to to lead in in tech, New York continues to lead in tech, but we also grow complementary to these other hubs as well. And they and they have their own ecosystem, they can have their own, you know, you guys have fintech, obviously, we have you know, a lot of other streams of tech here and, and they they can specialize and, and have their own regions that, that really nail something specific. I'm curious, just, I'm going to just like throw this out there. Um, yeah. Do you think there's a future for crypto in New York with the fintech? Oh yeah. Presence? I mean, we already see a ton, ton happening here. Yeah. Although, you know, we have um, a ton happening in crypto here, but we also have uh, some pretty tight regulations here, tighter That's than kinda... anywhere else. Um, yeah. And so we actually often hear of companies who like literally will just, start in New Jersey, which is across the river <laughs> um, to get around some of that stuff. But, you know, listen, I also think DC is taking a closer look at what's happening in crypto. Um, so maybe we'll get some federal answers here. Um, and it, the, it, it's DFS here, the Department of Financial Services. They were starting to spend a lot more time um, talking with industry this year. Uh, but COVID really got in the way of a lot of that to be more collaborative with the crypto industry yep. than it, it had felt more um, less collaborative, shall we say. Uh, but now, again, COVID is taking all the action out of the room. And also um, our governor's current situation has, has made those conversations. I'm just, I, ho- I hope they're all still happening. It's just um, yeah. a I distraction mean- from the business of running a state, I would say. The NFTs, though, they're certainly an interesting yeah. offshoot of and if the there's, pandemic. You know, yeah, and you know, New York, this is the NFTs, like art collectors, like that is non fungible token. Yeah, by the way, non fungible tokens, you know, we're essentially talking about um, different ways to be trading the values of, of assets. Um, and art is a big one where we're seeing it, music's a big one where we're seeing it. And that, and I mean, the stock markets are all based here. like all of the pieces, the NFTs are, you know, it's a conglomeration of like a lot of things, how, yeah. how I think humans already think of them. And all those things are here. Like we, you know, we had not to do that stuff here in New yeah. York. I feel, yeah. I feel the Coinbase that. IPO that we're going to have is going to be yeah, it's a big pretty one. remarkable, right? Yeah, it's a big one. Oof, man. Okay. So as we come to a close for today's conversation, first off, it's been a joy as always. I'm a little bit bummed we're not on a mountain this time. Oh, I know. Last time we did this, it was in Boulder. Yeah. Yeah. And we had, I mean, we were going to do Toronto. That was going to be our 2020. I guess we're going to have to get the gang back together. So I can't wait. uh, I know it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, What would you like to, to leave everybody that is joining today? Um, what kind of wisdom would you like to leave them yeah. with? Wisdom. I don't know what wisdom. I don't know. I don't know what wisdom I got. But, you know, I will say that um, right before this, I had a call canceled last minute. And so I was able to go outside. Um, and I mean, we were talking about this before everyone got on. You know, it's the first really warm day here. The shots, you know, the vaccines are going really well. And I don't mean to diminish what tough times we find ourselves in all, all across New York, all across the world. Um, and there are people who are really, really struggling, but I just feel really hopeful right now. You know, the weather definitely helps, but it's yep. so nice to feel hopeful again. And I know yep. that part of why I love the work I get to do is that the tech industry is made up of like hopeful, entrepreneurial people who want to solve problems. And if there has ever been a time when problem solving 
is going to be more important. You know, it, it's, it's 2021, 2022. So we've got a lot of work to do. I'm, I'm with you. I think that this is, we're on the brink of something very, very exciting, right? The last big tech boom came out of 2008. Every time we have these levels of downturn, that's when we have the most innovative, most mm -hmm. interesting moments. Um, and so I, I'm curious to see what comes out of this one. There's going to be entirely new companies that we've never even thought of. Uh, maybe the NFTs are part of it. I don't know. But I think everybody that's joining today, we we don't know what the future is going to look like, but it will be bright and it will be interesting. It will never be boring. It will It'll continue never be in San boring. Francisco. Yeah. It'll continue in New York, but it'll yeah. probably continue in some other places too. Yeah, which is yeah. good for the world. Yeah, I'm down. All right. Yeah. Well, Thank I will, you so you much. You get out into the sun. Yeah. I'm gonna thank I'm, you, Julie. I'm gonna go thank for you, a jog. Bye, go jog, everyone. Okay. Thank Thanks, everybody. You. Bye bye. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.